Uh, good afternoon. I'm Edward Torello with uh, Score Bucks County, and I'm in charge of the webinar program. I'm just going to give you a one-minute commercial uh, on Score, in case some of you do not know who we are. We're actually a national organization. We have 350 chapters nationwide. We're partially funded by the Small Business Administration, and we've got 13,000 plus mentors uh, countrywide. And in Bucks County, we have 75 mentors, and that's Bucks County and part of Montgomery County. Our mission is very simple, to help small businesses to either start, to grow, or to thrive. And uh, we do that through our mentoring program and through our webinar program. Um, if you'd like more information on how to have a, a, a mentor help you, and or if you'd like to volunteer to be a member, a mentor, excuse me, please go to our website uh, at buckscountyscore.org and just click on the appropriate box and someone will get in touch with you. And now we're about to begin our program. Again, as I said, please put your um, questions in the Q&A box. We have today... Uh, our webinar, as you can see the title, How Do Facebook and Google Ads Work? And we're very fortunate to have Donna Body, who's the owner of Delos Incorporated, uh, actually here in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. And Delos makes the web work for the, their small business and nonprofit customers by providing websites, digital marketing services, and training. And Donna is also a certified score mentor, which I think is also important to know. And she understands all of your wants and needs as far as a small business owner. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Donna to start the presentation. Donna. Thank you, Ed. It's nice to be here and I'm glad to um, help out. And we see a lot of confusion about how do Facebook and Google ads work. So I hope to be able to clear all that up. Um, you know, put your questions in the Q&A as you go along. Uh, I will have time to uh, get to those uh, as we go and at the end. So as Ed said, uh, my company is Delos Incorporated. And what we do is we make the web work for you. Uh, we believe that you should be able to use your digital presence to scale and grow your business. And that's what we help our customers do. So we get a lot of questions about advertising on social media. Social media tools are not very friendly. There's tons of options out there. Um, so we have companies that are spending thousands of dollars a month and, you know, some are spending a hundred dollars a month and some of those people are getting great returns and some of them are getting terrible returns. And so we really need to, uh, understand a little bit about how it all works so that you can get a good return on your investment. It can be an excellent investment or it can be a money pit. So I want to help you try to make sure if you're going to do advertising that it gets you a good return. But it can be really overwhelming because you don't have enough time to figure it all out. There's too much information. You know, it hasn't been working for you and it's changing too fast. And this is a big one because it's uh, constantly changing all of the time and it's hard to keep up with those things. So we're going to go over some basics of how do the Google and Facebook ads work. There are similarities between these advertising and also other ones like Bing and LinkedIn and using um, Twitter and things like that for advertising. But Facebook and Google are the most widely used platforms. There are about 7 billion Google searches every day. And Facebook has 14 billion active users a day. So both companies, though, make their revenue primarily through advertising. So that's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about a term of organic traffic versus paid traffic. Organic traffic means things that show up without you doing any advertising whether that's in someone's Facebook feed or whether it's in a Google search. So let's take a look at Google and also um, 
Facebook so you can kind of see. In the Google search, the organic search results appear on the listing when you type in a query. They show up typically below the ads. Uh, in our screenshot, you could see that Stacia's Bakery on the phone has two different listings. One is the ad because it has ad next to it. And the other is the organic listing, which is how it would rank via SEO or search engine optimization. The ads usually are appearing at the top of the search results and they are uh, indicated by, uh, it will say that it is an ad. Now, Facebook and Instagram will appear in your news feed or in your other feed or in your stories with a little thing either called, uh, you know, sponsored is going to tell you that that was an ad that was placed. Organic uh, reach would be just something you post on your page. Now, one thing that I want to make clear about um, organic versus uh, paid ads. For organic traffic on Google, you might have gotten phone calls from people saying, hey, we can guarantee you the first page of Google. No, nobody can do that. It's not how it works. Google has an algorithm. It, it has about 120 different things. There are things that you can pay attention and there are things that you can do to make yourself rank higher in there, primarily by having the answers to the questions that people ask when they are in uh, search. Uh, and if you are a local business, by making sure that you appear on the map and that you've claimed your Google My Business listing. In Facebook uh, and Instagram and most social media, but let's talk about Facebook and Instagram here. When you make a post on your page, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of your followers will see that. Again, there is an algorithm that Facebook uses that determines who will actually see the post in your feed. So if you have, let's say 100 followers, today's average is 5% of the followers will actually see your organic post. That means about five people will see. Now, again, it can vary from, um, place to place and what your content is and, you know, who shares it and who comments on it and that sort of thing. But generally speaking, the average today is about 5% reach when you make an organic post, which if you notice, that's why Facebook tells you, would you like to boost this post as soon as you make it in order to get broader reach? So where does advertising uh, if you've seen me speak before, you've probably seen this slide where I kind of tell you that your website should be the center of your online strategy. And the reason is that you own it and you control the content there. You can put your most important messages there and it gives you a place for driving traffic to that you control the message. And then you want to use social media and your email marketing as a way to expand your reach and to communicate with people who know you. It's perfectly fine to have the same content. You're probably going to have maybe some other types of content on social media that you don't have on your website, but all your core information should be on your website. And one of the other reasons for that is this gives you a lot of flexibility. The actual uh, spokes on this wheel, I have changed again and again. Like right now I'm saying, should I add TikTok in there? Should that go in there somewhere, right? Depending upon your audience is going to depend on where your um, specific social media platforms sh should be. 
So what advertising does is allow you to expand your reach on these other platforms beyond people that know you already. But the goal should be eventually getting them back to your website and taking a call to action there or a landing page, uh, again, can be on your website as well. So let's take a look at how paid ads work. The basics of what we have in terms of paid ads are you need to think about what is it that you are offering. You need to know what it is you want people to do. That's your call to action. And then this is key. Who are you targeting? Because it's such a noisy world out there and we get so many different messages coming into us all the time, we really are good at tuning out anything we don't consider relevant to us. So there's different ways that you can target based on a location that someone lives in. If you're a local business and you're serving a local area, if I'm a restaurant, I really don't want to target people three states away. I know exactly what it is. We have some uh, daycare clients where people are like, no, people want to be within five miles. People are not going to take their child 20 miles away unless it's on their way to work. So generally speaking, that's uh, what you can do. You can target by, um, you know, are you looking at uh, men? Are you looking at women? Are you looking at a certain income level? And then you need to think about what your budget is. So when you start off with an ad, again, what are you trying to get people to buy? What is your offer? What do you want them to do in order to take advantage of that offer? Who are they? And how much money do you want to spend? Now, knowing that information, The ads are an auction. One question I get over and over and over again, how much is it going to cost? Well, it's really an auction. So it kind of depends on who else is bidding for that same customer and those same information that you're looking at. So there's no fixed price. And when you pay, you can do things like pay per click. Uh, Google ads work this way. You can uh, set up your Facebook ads this way as well in that you pay only when someone clicks on your ad. You, there are also other metrics you can use, which is per impression. How many times does someone see it? You might pay for that. And then also you can do per conversion. In other words, not only did someone click, they actually add it to the cart or made a phone call to me or uh, filled out the form, whatever it is, that would be considered a conversion. So the cost depends on how much competition do you have, what you are offering, and then the quality of your ads. So why does what you're offering make a difference? So if I am selling something that I know my lifetime value of a customer, and this is what's important, you need to think about a lifetime value of a customer, that this customer will buy a service off of me and I will make $50,000, well, I can afford to spend a lot of money to get that customer. But if I'm going to have a customer where I have $10 profit, well, it better not cost me $10 or $20 to get a customer. So um, <clears throat> what product you're offering, certain industries are much more competitive than others. So for example, um, one of the examples I, I like to tell people about I've seen is San Diego injury lawyer. If you want to bid on that term on Google, you're going to pay like $700 a click. 
but it's probably worth it to those people because of the people you're getting, it may uh, determine that, you know, you, they'll make more money than that. And then the quality of the ads is also a factor. You know, is the ad itself engaging to people? Is it getting people based upon who you're targeting? Is the ad right for those people? And then the landing page you take them to, is that relevant? One of the big mistakes that we see people do all the time is they may have a little Google ad campaign going or a Facebook ad campaign, and they've got a very specific offer they're making, but they send someone to the homepage of the website. Now, at that point, you expect someone to click around and try to find out exactly how do I find this offer that the ad was making. Any friction you put in the process, you end up losing people. So it's important that the, uh, the target you have matches the information in your ad, which also then matches the information where you're taking them to for clicking. So is it expensive? And again, the answer is it depends. In general, a broad market is going to be more expensive than a very narrow market. There'll be less competition there, less people. Um, you know, the geographic range you're going to try to get. If you want people all around the country, it might cost you more than if you're trying to find people just locally. And then it depends on the keywords and the audience you're charging, you're looking for. Who else is competing against those? If you're in a market where you're competing against major national chains and they have a lot of money to spend on ads, it's going to cost you more than if you're in a very niche market that not as many people are advertising in. And that is also a strategy to use if you are competing against some of those bigger ones is to try to find the more niche focus rather than the general broad service. Um, if you have more competitors, it's going to cost more than if there's less competition. If you have a higher value offering, it's probably going to cost more than if you have a lower cost offering. Again, because it doesn't make sense to spend more money when you're not going to make very much money. And it does make sense. You could still make a lot of money if it's a higher value. Again, let's look at an example of the lifetime customer. So if you make a hundred dollar profit over the life of a customer and you run ads, and let's say that it costs you a dollar a click. If it costs you a dollar a click and it takes 10 clicks to get a customer, then it costs you $10 to get that customer where you're going to make $100. So you should probably do that all day long. On the other hand, if it costs you, you know, $10 a click and it takes you 15 clicks to get a customer, that customer costs you $150, but you only made $100. So Again, take a look at, this is where knowing what you're offering, knowing the value of a customer to you, and then being able to go through and look at the metrics. That's actually one of the best things about the advertising online is the data that's there that can tell you exactly what's working, what it's costing, and you know, are you making money? Is this a good value and a good return on your investment? Uh, if you have an urgent need versus brand awareness, you're probably going to have to spend more to advertise the urgent need. 
uh, urgent need might be like a locksmith. Nobody looks up a locksmith until they need them right now. Or if I typed in 24 hour plumber, right? Someone's going to buy right at that minute. That's going to cost more than if you have an ad that's running where you just kind of want people to get to know who you are. Maybe just you want the broadest distribution and impressions. That's going to cost less because there's not, they're not going to buy right then. The other thing is that a cold audience is going to cost more, generally speaking, than a warm audience. A warm audience are people that already know you and are predisposed to interact with you versus somebody you don't know at all. So those are just some of the general things that can, that can tell you where it's going. Um, as you can kind of tell, there's a little bit of uh, experimentation for the market you're going with in order to get it right. So is it worth it? Well, again, know that lifetime value of a customer. So you want to measure how many impressions did your ad have? If my ad had 100 impressions, how many times did someone click on that? If somebody clicked on that 10 times, that means 10% is my click-through rate. That goes into quality. The more people that see your ad and click through is an indication that that is a good uh, ad fit for the audience you're targeting. How many people click is the click-through rate? How many of those people actually become a lead? They filled out your form, they added to cart, whatever, and then how many buy? So by measuring all these things, we can tell exactly what's working, what we might not need to improve in quality, uh, how can we get the cost down, and then knowing the lifetime value of a customer to know, okay, I'm going to do this all day because I is bringing me more customers and I'm making more money than it's costing me, or this is maybe not the right avenue. It's a too competitive area. Um, and um, I'm going to think of a different method in order to do this. So how do you keep your costs down? Well, you need to be really specific, very specific in your ads. You know, big companies might be running, you know, thousand different versions of ads at the same time, all tailored at very specific things. As a small business, don't really want you to do that, but I want you to really think about that niche and a very specific thing. If you offer 20 services, one ad to advertise those 20 services is not going to do as well as one ad targeting that specific service that someone is looking for at the time. And then there's your ad quality. Who are you targeting? Are you targeting the right people for your offer? And then there's your copy and your creative, right? Are you attracting someone's attention? If it's in social media, we have a term that we call stop the scroll. You know, is somebody going to scroll by this or is this something that they're going to uh, really uh, get their attention because it's what they need? And then there's your landing page, where you take them to. Is it really simple and obvious what the next step they should take? And are they able to do it? If I see your ad at midnight and it's only taking me and saying call on the phone, well, maybe that's not a good time to call. Or, and this is important too, um, both for social media and for Google searches, more searches happen on a mobile device than on a desktop device today. So how does your information, does your ad look good on mobile? Does your landing page work well? If there's a form to fill out, are you getting only the information you need so that people uh, 
fill it out? Does it work on a mobile device? Do people have to pinch and zoom? Or is your landing page so slow that people click back before there? Everything that you can do in that area is going to improve the quality score, which is going to help your cost. So let's talk a little bit about ad placements. Uh, if you advertise on Google, you have a bunch of different choices. There's what's called the search network, and that's the Google search that we're familiar with. You bring it up and you see the, the, the blue listings and links there on doing that. Also important, though, for local businesses is showing up on a Google map. Near me searches are um, off the charts. That's what people look for. They want to be something that is relevant to me. If I want pizza right now, I really don't want Google showing me pizza in Kansas City because I'm not in Kansas City and I'm really looking for where I can go for lunch in an hour. So being on the map is uh, very important. Uh, YouTube is another ad placement that you can do with Google search. Um, YouTube, by the way, is the number two search engine that's out there, uh, followed by the number, you know, following number one, which is Google. So you can have little ads on YouTube as well. And then there's the, what's called the display network. And these might be ads that you see like in Gmail, in uh, mobile apps that you might use and on other websites. So you can use uh, one or any combination of all of these when you do a Google ad. Now, when you do a Facebook ad, you also have various options. Uh, it can appear in the newsfeed. You can have a stories ad. It can be on Instagram, Instagram stories or reels or Instagram feed. They can appear in Marketplace. They can appear in a messenger inbox and they can also appear on external apps, much like Google's display network. So that's um, something that you need to think about where your ad's gonna appear. And this impacts a little bit about your creative because they will appear differently in the different places. And so you're able to preview um, how it looks on the different spots. So um, that's uh, on that. Um, I do want to, I see there's a, uh, a few questions that I just want to try and take a couple of them uh, right now because they relate to what we're doing before I go into the next part, which is the difference between search ads and social media ads. So um, if you go, if you boost is a question, you go from 5% to how much reach, and it really depends on the audience you're targeting. When you go through and pick your audience and your budget, uh, Facebook will tell you how much potential reach that you're going to have as far as that goes. Uh, I see a question for Diane. What if you are bare bones and don't have a big budget for ads? Again, there's some lower cost ways to experiment. And again, it's thinking about what's that customer worth to you on what the budget should be. This type of thing is an investment. You can get there organically by showing up in search and having a great you know, viral social media post or things like that. Advertising is just a way to get there faster. So you can be judicious with a budget, but you definitely need a budget. It's not going to be a dollar a day sort of thing. Um, I do know people getting very good results uh, $10 a day. You can do on Facebook some cheaper things and shorter campaigns. So again, the thing to think about is what is it that you are offering and what is the value to your customer and what is what, how much money do you make off a customer? And certain customers you have to think about like if I am a hairdresser, for example, I'm not looking to cut your hair one time. I want you to come in every six weeks 
and come back and I want you to be my customer for years. So think about what your industry is. Is it, a, you know, is it repeat business and um, what is the margin in it? Stacy asked if we can talk about the quality of the ads. And I think that we um, have covered that. But if you have any specific additional questions about that, just put that again in the chat. Um, Gary asked, what's an average click-through rate? Well, it really depends on what you're, what you're looking at and how warm your audience is and how well you've targeted. You know, typically um, you're always trying to improve that. We often run a lot of, even on small campaigns, like an A ad and a B ad, which one is performing better? Let's try to get the click-through rate up higher because that's gonna get our quality score. Let's drop the lower performing ad. Um, you know, depending upon your audience, if it's somebody that really knows you, you know, a 30% click-through rate could be really good. On a cold traffic thing, a 3% click-through rate can be good. It just depends on the um, actual situation. As I said, there's not really a uh, science to this in a, in a pat formula. There are things that you can try, but you have to experiment a little bit. Um, Stacy asks, if you're offering a discount in your ad, how do you clearly integrate that into your landing page where you drive your customers? Copy enough or should there be a click to activate and then it's integrated in the checkout page? Um, you can have a code uh, on your checkout page if this is an e-commerce thing. If this is not an e-commerce and you're offering a discount, you should get their email address so that that is traffic you own and send them their code in the email. Hopefully that answer is yours. Um, how do you know how much is a good cost ahead? I'm assuming that maybe that's like a lead or there's sources and some generic information. And again, I'm going to just say that um, know what the value of a customer is to you. Know your cost structure, know how much money you're making, and that will tell you if this is a good investment for cost per lead or not. I don't wanna spend $500 to get a customer that I'm gonna make $100 off of. I would definitely spend that amount to get a customer I'm gonna make $10,000. So knowing who you're targeting and knowing your cost structure is really important. Um, okay. I'm going to get to some of these other questions at the end, so we'll get through, but keep the questions coming. They're great. And I'm gonna move on to our next part because I think it might help clarify some different things here. And that is, uh, what's the difference between search ads like Google and social media ads? like you would have on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. And the main difference is user intent. And what that means is on Google, or when I go to YouTube and search, for example, I am searching for something specifically. Find a painter near me. So I'm in actively looking for something. But on Facebook and in social media, I'm scrolling my feed and the ads are shown based upon my interests and behaviors. So in Google, you specify keywords. So this is what someone is looking for. So this type of advertising is best for purchase intent. People are looking to buy now or they're especially for B2B brands, people are researching a particular thing. The questions that people ask in search are very specific. If you have an article or information that targets exactly what they're looking for, those are key words that you can, can do. Again, understanding your audience, understanding what they're looking for, 
will tell you which keywords and phrases you should be targeting. Now on Facebook and social media, you target people based on their interest and demographics. So you have um, advanced targeting capabilities. So your ad can appear in the newsfeed of your ideal customer. So this custom, this platform is primarily a social platform and it favors visual content. So this is a lot more attractive for building brand awareness and community and uh, community. For example, I can target people who are interested in cooking. I can target people who are parents of preschoolers. I can target people in a specific geographic range. So you want to know who your customer is and what they are looking for. Um, paid search helps prospective customers find your business and paid social helps your business find prospective customers. You're reaching out to them. Hopefully that makes clear on what the difference is. Now, that said, there's been a lot of changes going on recently. Um, you may have heard about, and if you are an advertiser, you've definitely seen this from Facebook, the changes that Apple did with their most recent iOS, where people have to opt in to tracking. So it used to be that Facebook would know so much about you because it was tracking you no matter what website you went around to, what app you were in, all the different things you were doing. So they knew that you subscribed or, or visited that cooking show all the time. Um, so they're able to target that a little bit better. So now the targeting is going to become a bit less clear because most people have been opting out of tracking when presented and uh, Apple's platform is a lot more prevalent than uh, Android uh, phones and such. So um, we still can do this. It's going to just get a little bit more trickier as time goes on. And, the, and Facebook is working on a lot of algorithms like AI to try to still get you the right people of where you want to go. But the main difference is to know that when I go in a search, I am looking for something. In social media, it's kind of like appearing in my feed. And hopefully it's something I'm interested in because then I want to go, like, oh yeah, I do want to check this out. This is an interesting thing. Um, uh, but you may have had the experience of like some ads appearing that are totally irrelevant to you and some ads that are relevant to you that make you find something that you didn't know you wanted. And that's the main difference between search and social. What is the user doing? What are they intending? when they are using the platform. So the next part is um, traffic and audiences. Warm audiences versus cold audiences. Again, a warm audience is someone who knows you either because they visited your website, they follow you, they've engaged with something you've done before, um, they're on your email list, and a cold audience is someone who you do not know whatsoever. So where this comes into play is this concept of what we call retargeting, which is, is something that's there. So the cold audience, they haven't had any previous relationship with you, the warm audience has engaged with you already. And one of the one things that we often do when we uh, run some campaigns, particularly in the social area, is we may just have some brand awareness campaigns going on to a cold audience. So like, let's say we've got like a video of a, of a different thing, like of a, a, a travel agent client, for example, we did a video when the new Star Wars uh, thing opened, right? So we were targeting people that like Star Wars, that like Disney, and we were just wanting them to view this video, which kind of gave them a little tour of how things were working. 
And so we got really good rates on that. And that type of thing is, is cheaper than actually, you know, let's say, filling out a quote form because I want to book a trip with you to go through there. But a warm audience then is somebody who we can kind of go back later with a more specific promotion or something and say, let's show it to all these people that liked our video or watched all of our video or watched 75% of our video. And then you also have the concept in Facebook of the, what's called these lookalike audiences. And Facebook, use your magic and algorithm and all these people that interacted with our video, can you find me people just like them and show them this offer too? So that's kind of a way of um, getting some of your costs down. Whereas if you just showed a cold offer, hey, here's a promotion, do this to someone who's never heard of you, uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a tougher sell because you know we're all in the business here of small businesses of building no like, and trust. It takes multiple touches for people to understand who we are and why I might want to do business with me. So um, this is another little graphic I've used often, like, you know, you have the paid traffic, which is what we're talking about. We also have the earned traffic, which is our organic that's doing very well. But really our goal is to convert these people to owned traffic. And for the most part, that means we should be building our email list. If I've got you interested in me, I should be able to get you on my list so that I can continually have regular touches to you. You know, we talked about 5% organic reach in Facebook. Uh, email deliverability is like 95%. My email to you is going to sit in your inbox until you do something with it, even if you just look at it and delete it. Whereas if you've tried to find something on social media from last week or last month or six months ago, chances are that you're not going to find it at all. So I like to tell people, you know, you want to be thinking about how to get people on your list and that it's so important that you communicate regularly with them on this list. And again, it is an interesting, informative, entertaining, educational. It's not communicating with them. Bye, 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 bye. Okay. That doesn't work very well. Uh, I want you to think about your email list and your digital marketing in general is what you are doing is building relationships with your customers and potential customers. What would you say to them in person? Or if you saw them or if they came into your store, oh, hey, here's some news I want to show you about this. Okay, that can be an email. That can be social media. It can help doing that. But again, the whole point of all this is to build that know, like, and trust to get them to be warmer audiences, to get them to be a customer to you. So um, I'm going to go into next what we're going to do to get started, but I'm going to just, I'm going to take a few more questions here. Um, Connie asks, my company is home-based with communications being by email and phone. Well, I'd like Google to show me if someone was asking for a local company. I can't post my address as I don't meet clients here. How best can that be handled? Uh, I'm going to tell all of you local businesses that if you do not and have not claimed your Google My Business listing, you need to do that. That's how you show up on the map. However, Google has an option for local businesses that says, I visit customers at their sites. So example might be like, oh, I'm a, I'm a, uh, a roofer. 
I, I don't need to have an office. No client is going to come to my office. I'm going to come to your home and I'm going to put the roof on your house there. So that's what's called a, a service area business in Google. And you have the option of saying, don't show my home address, but here are the zip codes or the areas that I serve. And so that's what you should do in, in that case for showing up organically and on the map with Google. Um, Katie asks if, our, uh, do we offer services where we'll set up an ads manager account? It is so confusing and um, yes, we do. And uh, I, I like to use the accountant analogy, right? You could in theory figure out how to get all this stuff set up on your own. Like what tax returns do I need? What's my chart of account look like? Or you can hire someone to kind of set it up and set you on the right path because it is changing all the time. And uh, there are a lot of one-time setup things. So if you wanted to, you know, email or reach out after, um, we can do that. Diane asked, is per conversion more expensive than pay per click? Yes, it definitely is. Because again, not everyone that clicks is going to convert over and fill out your form or call you or join your email list or add to cart and buy. So typically you're looking at a smaller percentage of people who are going to do that. And that's generally cost more. But again, a conversion is a sale, essentially, or a lead that's farther down the road than a click. So it's worth more as well. What do you think the most effective advertising method to promote a new service-based business, Alex asks? Uh, again, you have to claim that Google listing get your uh, tractions out there, but I think it depends on the type of business and who your clients are. Who is your audience? Where are they? And is it something that like, I need it, I need it now? Should Google be best? Uh, is it something, um, again, it, I, without knowing the type of business, I, there's not a single answer, except for making sure for organic that you do convert that, your claim that listing on Google. Someone told me that when you buy Google AdWords, if you ever decide to cancel, you'd be blacklisted from appearing in organic search results in the future. Chino asked, um, that's not true. The organic search and the paid ads are independent algorithms and um, I would not worry about that. It is true that if you are buying traffic with the paid traffic, it's great. But as soon as you stop paying, that paid traffic goes away, which is so important. But what I have on the screen right now is that you are converting those people who are interested in you into own traffic. That means people you can now contact. Um, Do you think branding exists in online advertising? I'm still pushing for consistency in brand elements, fonts, colors, photography. I want clients' ads to be instantly recognizable. Yes, that's so important because, as we mentioned, it takes multiple touches for people to start to recognize you. If every time you have a different colors or different logos, a completely different look, how will I start to recognize that it is the same brand? Um, Facebook Advertising Manager keeps saying that our advertisement doesn't comply with their policy. However, without detailed information, how do you solve this problem? Facebook has a lot of rules as to what is allowed and what is not allowed. And unfortunately, they are very obscure about them. There are certain industries that are going to have a very difficult time advertising on Facebook. Facebook also doesn't like ads that appear to single out a person or are negative, right? You couldn't have an ad approved that said, hey, you're fat. It's time to lose some weight. Okay, that's not a good thing. It's not something because they feel like it's, it's targeting uh, someone directly. 
There's, um, you know, also things like, um, you know, there's policies on weapons and things like that. Now, a lot of the reviewing is automated review. So you kind of have to appeal if you know that you are within the policies. For example, we had a customer who has a knife sharpening business. Basically, he sharpens kitchen knives and barber shears and lawn mowers. But uh, originally, ads got rejected saying you can't advertise weapons. Well, again, we appealed and got it done. But so the algorithms, rather than a person, takes a, a glance at them. So without knowing further, like what your information is, their, their policy, there are certain things that, that they do not like. There's also certain things where you have to be verified. For example, if this is a political message, you need to verify who you are. You can't do that um, without those verification. They won't uh, run your ads in that case. All right, so let me get back then to the next part here, which is how, um, how do you get started? What do you do? And keep the questions coming there, good. So again, you need a platform that you own. I recommend that your website, where are you going to take people once they click on your ad? You have to have a way to, get, to capture those people, to turn them into that owned traffic so that you're making the most of your money so that you can follow up cheaper with them. And then... That is something, investing in your website over time, which will help you more organically over time. The ads help you get there faster, uh, but it's going to cost you more money and it's not going to last if you stop spending. So depending upon the type of business you're building and the margins you have, you can run the whole thing basically just on ads in a single page. You know, but if you're trying to build up the organic presence over time as well, you'll have to invest a little bit more in there. But again, make sure that you can create pages that take people to directly what you want them to do in the ad. And that's typically your website. So if you want to start advertising on Google, ads.google.com is where you go for that. You need a Google account. Now, it doesn't have to be a Gmail account. You can create a Google login account without Gmail. Uh, it is helpful if you use the same account that you tie to Analytics, Search Console, and the Google My Business. To claim your Google My Business listing, you also need a Google account. Analytics and Search Console are two tools that your website should be set up and running. It tells you things like, where are you showing up organically? What terms are people looking for when Google shows my website? Um, when people come to my site, where do they go? How long do they stay? You know, how fast is my performance? Google likes three things organically. And for ads, it counts towards your quality. Everything has to work really well on a mobile device. Everything has to be fast. And speed is something they are just getting more and more uh, insistent about because their studies have shown that people click away and don't visit your site when it is too slow, especially on a mobile device. So um, that's something that needs to be a consideration on your website platform. Uh, the third thing they look for is security. And so everyone should, at this point on their website, have the little lock icon, which indicates an SSL certificate, 
Um, if you don't, Google is dinging you for that in organic search, and they're not going to like it in the paid search either. So uh, analytics and search console, Google My Business, and ads can all be tied together. It's best if you have just one account to manage them all. We do an audit service for people where we kind of go and look at all their stuff. And a lot of times half our audit is trying to help them track down what accounts were used to set up what and to try to consolidate them all into one place so that they know that they can manage it all from one place and tie it together. So then when you set up a Facebook account, you would go to business.facebook.com. And that is uh, ads manager is where you want to go. When you have a business page you and when you have an ads manager account, you need to have a personal Facebook profile that manages that page. And you can have multiple people manage the page. It doesn't mean that people see anything from your personal profile. It's just that Facebook and uh, LinkedIn also works this way, requires you to have a personal page to manage that business page. If you have an Instagram account, you're going to want the Instagram account to be a professional account or a creative account, not a personal Instagram. And you're going to want to link the Facebook page to the Instagram page. And that's going to let you run ads on Instagram as well as on Facebook. Now, a question we get asked a lot of the time is uh, boosting versus uh, ads manager. Boosting is the simple thing that Facebook gives you when you first like make a post, hey, do you wanna boost this? The main difference is that you have less options on types of uh, campaigns that you can run. So when you run a campaign, you can run for engagement. I wanna get clicks. You can run for like page likes. You can run for like website traffic. I want people to go click on a link somewhere. There's lead ads. There's video views, there's all different types of ads that you can run, but you don't have all of those options and you don't have all the placements in boosting than you do in Ads Manager. Ads Manager is a bit more complicated, but you're really going to get better data out of that and you're going to get more uh, targeting options and campaign options that way. So those are um, some of the information here. So the next part is how do you set yourself up for success? And really the main thing is having a plan. Here's where a score mentor can actually help you too. Do you have a you know, a business plan? Do you know enough about your business model to know what the lifetime value of a customer is? Uh, you know, do you have your cost structure under hood? What can you afford to invest in advertising to get a new client? You want to um, define your objective or goal. What are you trying to do with this ad? Are you trying to get phone calls? Are you trying to get leads? Are you trying to get people on an email list? Are you trying to just generate awareness? Are you trying to get website traffic? Are you trying to get foot traffic? There's all different types of things that you could be doing, but if you don't know what your objective is, how will you know if you've met it? And then the second thing is then, okay, who are we trying to reach? And this is what's so important to understand who your customer is and what are their concerns. What are their problems that you solve? Your product or service is the solution to something. So what are they searching for? What keywords do they use if they're looking for you or what your product can do for them or service? 
Um, what are the audience characteristics of someone who does that if you're doing on social media? So for example, um, you know, if you uh, have someone who is interested, you know, your product maybe is like a, a, an organic uh, farm product or something. So someone who's interested in organic is probably going to be different than someone that maybe they're not going to have liked McDonald's as uh, following that page, right? You can find different people, but knowing broadly, what are the demographics of your audience? You know, are you targeting senior citizens versus millennials versus, you know, Gen, Gen Z here? So understanding who that person is, the more you know about them, the more you can target, the more likely you're to get a better result. You want to have a match between who you're targeting and the keywords you're trying to reach and what you're offering. So then you want to set your budget. So is this campaign going to run forever? Is this like a two week promotion ahead of an event that's coming up? Um, how much do you want to spend per day? How much do you want to spend overall? And then you will create your message. It's your ad, the images, the landing page. You need to be the answer to the questions people have or the problems that people have. And your copy and your landing pages should all reflect that. And then you're going to measure and test. Now, the algorithms from Google and also Facebook are pretty good at trying to optimize for you. But a mistake that we see people make sometimes is that what you've got is, you know, oh, I don't like what's happening after one day, I'm gonna go change it. So Facebook, the rule of thumb is it takes like three days to really uh, get the algorithm going to where it needs to be. So once you set something up and start it running, don't change it within the first three days. You're just going to confuse it. It hasn't gotten time to optimize. I like to do the same thing with Google. You got to let it run a little bit. You have to let the algorithms, which they use a lot of the artificial intelligence. They're trying to get better results for you because they want more clicks because that's more advertising revenue for them. At the same time, they want that people that come there to search in Google, if, if the search results or the ads are terrible and don't give me what I want, I'm not going to come back to Google again. If my Facebook feed is totally annoyed of things which are difficult, um, you know, for me, like, I don't even know why I'm getting all this stuff. I'm going to be annoyed at Facebook and I'm going to want to use Facebook less. So they want your money. They want you to succeed here. Um, but so you let those things run a little bit, but then you do reevaluate. Am I getting the click throughs that I want? Am I getting the responses that I need? Are the people who are uh, getting to me, are they qualified? Are they the right people? And then you will tweak accordingly. But that's one of the great benefits of the digital stuff. If I was doing direct mail marketing, I can in theory say, yes, I'm targeting these households to get a, a postcard and all, but I don't know who just threw it in the mail without even looking at it. I don't know who read it. Um, all the data and information on the digital is tracked. And so you have a lot better metrics to help you uh, revise things. So that's, I want to get on to and leave some time for questions. I know it's a lot of information, but hopefully that has given you a very good uh, indication of how some of this works and how you might get started on doing this. Okay. So I see I that. I think that's great. Um, got a couple of questions, unfortunately, in the chat as opposed to uh, the regular Q&A. So I'll ask you those first and then okay. move over to the Q&A thing. Uh, where do you find out how your ads are doing? Well, in 
Google, you would go to ads.google.com and you would see the results from your campaigns, the keywords, all the reporting is there. In Facebook, you would go to business manager and you'd go to ads manager and you can see your campaigns there and you could pick different timeframes, different metrics, and that's where you would see how they're doing. Okay, here's another one that's interesting. Our business Facebook account uh, is only accessible on a mobile device. When I try to log in on a desktop, it says account temporarily unavailable. Your account is currently unavailable. Have you ever experienced this? I actually have experienced that. And typically it's when somebody tries to make a fake Facebook profile for a business, instead of making a business page tied to their personal profile. If Google, if Facebook suspects that the profile you've created is not a real person, they will shut that account down. Oh, okay. You have to, as an individual real profile, create a business page and manage it Mm -hmm. through the business page. Now, it could be that it's still just logged in on that phone and that's why you can still see it. So if you created a personal profile for your business and you're using that login to manage a business page, you should set up some other people to admin that business page, some real people and get rid of that account because uh, we did have a situation recently where uh, Facebook shut down the account and that account was the owner of the page. And it literally took months of work with Facebook to get the page back. Oh, okay. Why don't we take a look then at the Q and A part. Um, You've been moving right along there. What, What person are you on now? I think I was marking them as done or not. I mean, I marked as answer live. So, oh, okay. Oh, I see. Here we go. Uh, I, I'll go mark them as done, the ones that we answered. Okay. So we'll just go up. I think the top ones here. For example, uh, Facebook, uh, I, um, they keep moving them. I, I, Oh, here it's, I have not set up a website yet. How do you recommend how to do that or how to do this? Uh, Do you, have you claimed a domain? You must first claim a domain. One thing that's confusing to people sometimes is that owning the name you want is actually separate from a website or mail with it. You can have them all in one place, but your first thing is getting a domain name. And then you'll want to look into the the hosting. It depends on the type of business that you have. Um, We do a lot of WordPress sites because it's very well supported, powers about 35% of the web right now. Um, They can be set up pretty simply and quickly. They're very well supported and it's, you know, they can be pretty easy to use. Again, I do recommend that you hire someone to set it up because there's a lot of one-time setup things in there that, you know, you don't need to learn all that. Just like you didn't need to learn every tax return you needed to file, et cetera. Your accountant will tell you this, this, and this. Now it's set up for you. Mm -hmm. Um, If you are doing e-commerce, one of the simplest ways to get started with that is the Shopify platform. But again, you're going to need that domain name. Mm -hmm. Here's one that's interesting. How are Google's algorithms different from its competitor, DuckDuckGo? Well, Google knows a lot more about you, I guess, because you know, you're know you logged in to Google. So it will uh, personalize your search results and things for you. DuckDuckGo is known for its privacy and not tracking. I'm not sure that they have an ad platform. I don't really know that we've done any advertising for them. Um, again, just dealing with a lot of smaller businesses where budget is an issue. 
uh, you want to be where the most people are, and that is Google and YouTube for search. Mm -hmm. Here's an interesting one. Facebook uh, Advertise Manager, I guess Advertising Manager, kept saying our advertisement doesn't comply with their policy. However, without detailed information, how do I solve the problem? Yeah, I think I did talk a little bit about this one, and that is that um, you, the, you can look up online the, the policies and such, and if you want to reach out to me, I can probably send you a link to you know where you could find a little bit more information on the detailed policies, but it's probably something in the language of your ads or your landing page that you're clicking through to. Uh, Google does, or Facebook doesn't like if you redirect somewhere else, you have to take people to the actual one. Um, there's some issues with domain verification right now with iOS. I mean, it can be any number of things mm -hmm. that have caused that. Okay. Here's one interesting. Uh, what would be a range of rates that I could expect to pay for someone to place and manage either a Facebook ad or a Google ad? What's the range of prices you can pay for a car, right? <laughs> it kind of depends on what, uh, what your budget is overall and what you're trying to do and how, what kind of shape your initial account is set up in. You know, is this like requiring a whole setup and everything going going on to begin with, or you know, is there uh, creative and copy and stuff that exists already? Um, so I don't have a good answer to that, mm -hmm. and it also depends on you know what you're targeting and who who you are targeting. Uh, on doing that, as I mentioned, some people run like multiple campaigns at one time. Other people don't, but there should be, uh, the, you know, if, if you're looking at saying, I want to run like a Google ad campaign that I'm going to just like kind of run all the time, there's probably like an initial few months setup time that's higher and then a lower management fee once it's been tweaked and is running the way it needs to run. Okay. This one, I don't think you answered this. Do you think branding, oh, what happened to it? Um, question on branding. Uh, yes. Do you think branding exists in online advertising for a customer for a customer good? I am still pushing for consistency in brand elements such as fonts, colors, photography, etc. I want client clients ads to be instantly recognizable. What sort of thoughts do you have on that? Yes, consistency is very important and being recognizable is very important. Um, for emails, for example, we always set up a client template with their branding and basic info. We say, don't change that template, just put your new content in there because we want people to recognize and know and become expected of you. Uh, mm -hmm. Same thing with your, um, your ads and stuff. You can kind of you know, mix certain things up but uh, you do, you are trying to get people to uh, relate to you. If anyone's ever done like radio advertising, uh, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll never hear them say run one 30 second spot because it'll just, it won't register with people. Things don't register until you uh, see it a few times. I've seen seven touches. I've seen nine touches before somebody even, you know, realizes uh, who you are and um, consistent branding helps that. This one for you, I guess, personally, so to speak, do you offer services to do Facebook advertisement for your customers? If so, um, how, how about the price or what do you charge or how do you charge? Again, we, it depends on the customer, what shape their you know, website's in, their account, do they have all the things necessary to track? Have they verified their domain? Um, and and what, where, where are you starting from? And is that the best use of your time? We tend to take like a holistic approach with people on trying to do this to make sure that, you know, you're getting the best value for the, the money that you're spending. 
uh, and where you're going to get that re return. So I don't have a good answer for that. It, I think it's, you know, sometimes it's a, a matter of a initial higher setup kind of get going fee. Other times, um, you know, than an ongoing management fee. But we do different times things for people because we will set up the whole funnel, if you will, right? So maybe there's a landing page that someone signs up for something and then there's an email sequence they get to follow up to, uh, you know, invite a visit or make the purchase or so it, there's a range of things from very simple to very complicated and involved. So basically they should contact you if they're interested in your service and you can then sit down with them and personalize it accordingly. Yeah. And one of the things we do often with people is we have a, like an audit type of service. We're like, okay, tell us what you're trying to achieve. What are you doing now? Let's take a look at it and make sure everything is optimized and then give you recommendations for the quick wins and the different things that we think are going to move the needle for you where you uh, want to go. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if you answered this one. Um, once an ad is placed on Facebook, will you automatically be asked by them if you'd like to place it on Instagram? And they were wondering if they co-own those. They do co-own them. Um, for most effectiveness, you should link your Instagram business account with your Facebook business page. And this is where you'll have to go to um, ads manager to be able to select your placements. Um, you have the option of automatic placements and also manual placements and Instagram and Instagram stories are some of the options on there, depending upon the type of campaign that you're running, you'll see that option or not. Uh, okay. So that's something, you know, to think about um, getting that set up right. But yes, they are advertising directly. And I just want to let people know, too, for their organic stuff, Facebook has really been beefing up something called Facebook Creator Studio. It's under your publishing tools. And they're now letting you uh, schedule ahead of time and, and look at all of your stuff for Instagram and Facebook. And now uh, stories can also be scheduled uh, for what you're going to do. So you can manage then all of your posting for Facebook and Instagram in one place from Facebook Creator Studio. Oh, great. That's something new. All right. Well, we're right here pretty much at our appointed hour. I think we've worn you out with questions. Um, I want to thank you very, very much for a very informative presentation. I think people really enjoyed it. And if folks have anything else they'd like to know, your um, particulars are right here on the screen. You can email uh, Donna and she'll be happy to email you back. And if, awesome. any, of you, if any of you need a SCORE mentor... Donna is a SCORE mentor, and you can see we're highly qualified. Um, please uh, go to uh, SCORE's website at buckscountyscore.org. Again, thank you so much, Donna, and thank everyone for participating. Thank you, guys, for having me, and uh, hopefully everyone got a little bit out of this, and we will follow up with some links. I'll definitely include, like, the uh, Google My Business, how to do that if you haven't done that, and some of the other things we've talked about here as well. Great. Thank you again, Donna. Thanks. Thanks.